Today our speaker is Piero Gotardi from University of Essex, uh, and he's gonna tell us about simultaneous search and adverse selection. So before the uh, before turning the screen over to Piero, some reminders about uh, how we run these things. So during the 60 minute seminar, panelists will be able to ask questions by unmuting themselves, but attendees can ask live questions only during the uh, 15 minute Q&A after the 60 minute seminar. But anybody can ask written questions uh, during the seminar using the Q&A space of, of Zoom. So uh, the co-authors of the papers are also in the audience. So they may be able to answer uh, your written questions while Pierre is presenting. So you are seeing here our uh, list of panelists. As usual, we have an uh, excellent list of invited panelists. And in addition to the invited panelists, uh, some of the organizers, board members, and uh, regular panelists are also in the uh, in the Zoom. So next seminar is going to be next month. This is a, a monthly seminar series happening in the second Monday of every month. And in addition to the uh, seminar on May 9th, we also have a lecture for PhD student in May. The speaker is going to be uh, Simon Monge, and he's going to talk about firm dynamics and, and frictional labor market. And without further ado, I would like to uh, turn the screen over to Piero. Piero, uh, you can start sharing. OK, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity and uh, we just so this is um, this is joint work with um, Sarah and Ronald who are uh, also in the panel and can also answer question in speaking and in in the chat and uh, so the motivation of uh, of our work is to uh, is the fact that uh, there has been uh, we have several instances of markets uh, uh, characterized by the presence of search friction where adverse selection is relevant. Right, so this is common to decentralized market like labor markets, OTC markets, or insurance markets. And uh, at the same time, in this market that has been recently, uh, due to uh, various technological developments, there has been innovation uh, that have made it uh, easier for uh, facilitated contacts among uh, market participants, even in the absence of a centralized uh, uh, trading platforms. So there have been several posts that have uh, facilitated contacts between participants. And uh, the natural question that then arises is how does this innovation does these uh, changes have uh, affected the strategy of the traders uh, in this market and, and uh, hence have affected the allocations that are achieved in the market? What are the welfare consequences of that? And uh, in particular, uh, in this paper, we are going to focus on one particular aspect of this dimension, which is the possibility that uh, uh, agent traders in this market can uh, contact at the same time simultaneously uh, several trading partners uh, and uh, without having to uh, uh, contact one partner uh, at a time uh, they can contact simultaneously several trading partners and we're going to analyze that in a directed search environment where uh, the, for the trading partners are posted in uh, terms of trade and uh, therefore, they can essentially send an application to several of their counterparts at the same time. And uh, this, uh, we show in the, in the paper that this uh, possibility is going to generate a new uh, kind of trade-off. Because on the one hand, the possibility of sending several applications, of contacting several partners at the same time, is going to uh, reduce the search friction. It's going to... Uh, increase uh, the possibility that uh, I may be able to contact a trading partner and I will be, end up being able to trade. Uh, but on the other hand, in markets with adverse selection, uh, this uh, possibility of contacting several partners is reducing 
the ability that traders have to use the different liquidity properties of different markets uh, in order to screen traders with private information. And that the liquidity of the markets uh, have been, uh, um, plays an important role in, uh, in the allocation in markets with other selection allows to screen different traders. And that is going to, uh, and, that, and that therefore is going to uh, somewhat interact with the lower in search friction, uh, limiting uh, screening possibility on the other. And, uh, and this is going to have some, uh, some important implication as we, uh, as we see. The um, more specifically, the environment we consider is going to be an environment like in Akerlof. So we just, uh, just to highlight the concept, we just fix uh, exactly with that environment. Uh, so it's going to be uh, very simple. And the leading application we have also in terms of language is also going to be in the labor market. So as I said, we are thinking that uh, the same kind of issue can also arise if you talk about financial markets uh, and others, where uh, we can uh, we observe the possibility of requesting quotes from several uh, partners at the same time. And uh, so, what are the choices that the traders can face? We uh, face a situation where the firms are uh, choosing a wage which they're going to post uh, their post for their vacancy. And the workers uh, then can choose uh, to whom to apply, right? So this is like standard in directed search. The, uh, the novelty here is the fact that worker can, can send application to more than one firm. And uh, uh, in the next stage, then firms uh, are making an offer to one of their applicants. Again, the fact that worker can send multiple application means that worker can uh, receive multiple offers. Then they can choose which one to accept, reject the others, and there is therefore a clearing process that uh, uh, they need to occur that we describe uh, more in detail uh, when we go into the model. Uh, just to give a brief overview of the result, we are going to show that as a result of this possibility of multiple application, a fully separating equilibrium uh, does not always exist, unlike what are the standard findings in the literature on um, uh, directed search with adverse selection with a single application that only exists when adverse selection is sufficiently severe, again, in the sense that we'll make precise. And we'll also show that as the search friction vanish, uh, as the number of application that uh, agents can send in the market is going to uh, grow to infinity, uh, in the limit, the, the probability that a high productivity worker is higher is going to tend to zero. So they are going to be crowded out of the market. Uh, we also show that uh, when the adverse selection is less severe, as I said, the separating uh, equilibrium uh, in that case may not exist, but in that case, a partial pooling equilibrium exists where both low and high productivity workers are sending their application to the same wage and they may end up trading at the same wage. So we can both have partial pooling equilibria and multiple equilibria. Again, these are all novel features that uh, uh, characterize uh, the possibility that are a consequence of the possibility of application. And what is the, just to anticipate uh, the intuition for that property is the fact that uh, when uh, the traders can send, when the worker in the application can send several application, uh, the uh, opportunity cost of applying to high wage for the low productivity workers is going, to, uh, is going to decrease and therefore they are more willing to send application also to high wage to which the high tape applies. Similarly, the high productivity workers, they, uh, they uh, may consider the opportunity of sending application also to lower wage as a hedging device in case their application to higher wage uh, that are harder to convert into trade are not going to be successful. Um, and uh, again, in this case, when we look at the limit, uh, when the search friction is going to vanish, when the number of application is going to infinity, we can have uh, some inefficiency arising. We can have an efficiently high level of entry and frictional trade is going to persist in the limit. And uh, these again are novel findings that arise between the interaction between adverse selection and this multiple application. And uh, we're going then to discuss what are 
on this basis, we can then compare what are the welfare properties of allowing for multiplication. And we can, and we can see that allowing for multiplication may or may not be beneficial according to the environment we have. Just before yeah. getting, and yeah, ask, yeah, ask, sure. Sorry, hi, hi Pierre. Hi. Good to see you. <clears throat> um, I well, just wanted to clarify one a uh, couple of things. One is here separation occurs with it. It's just to to to, to confirm sep separation is happening by a, a probability of uh, of hiring, correct? Yes, yes. That's what I call the market liquidity, right? It's the probability of okay. trading that is determined by the I see. But at the end, only trading can only happen with between two parties. I cannot sign. Uh, I cannot trade both uh, firms oh. and workers. They a firm can only hire one worker each firm, and each worker can only as only can only work for one firm. Okay. All right. Thank so, you. So that is the reason why if a worker sends several applications, at the end he can only accept one if he receives multiple offers. Yeah, I understand. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so altogether, this, uh, this kind of work and these results are providing some, uh, uh, some new foundation for the uh, findings in the Akerlof model, but with some twist, because as we, say, we, don't, we get uh, some aspect of convergence to the uh, Akerlof equilibria where uh, trade occur in Varesian market at a fixed price, uh, but not always, right? So there are some qualification to be added. And uh, you want to argue that uh, this, there is an interesting connection between uh, the approach we pursue in the paper and the literal non-exclusivity. Uh, so the, in this environment, trade is exclusive as just discussed with Ali. So every worker can only uh, uh, work is in uh, labor is indivisible and it can only work with one firm. But uh, what is not exclusive is the application process. I can apply to several firms at the same time. And moreover, my portfolio application is not observable. And uh, the um, liquidity of the market, as we said, in, in the case of uh, markets with a single, um, um, with a single application that proved uh, an important role in screening the device, the possibility that I can send several applications has also uh, the effect of limiting the possibility of screening work and in the similar way as uh, contracting with multiple partners at the same time has uh, in limiting screening. Uh, and we see there are going to be a clearly connection with the findings in particular obtained by in this paper by Atar, Amariotti and Salani in Econometrica for the Akerlof model as well. And- So, uh, so, so Pierre, so, so in yeah. a labor market, often offers are observable, right? So many people that collect multiple offers and show them either to the incumbent firm to, to get higher wages. So I can see clearly that, that in product markets, maybe they're not observable, maybe they're imperfectly observable in the labor market, but it's not 100% obvious. So what is not, yeah, what I'm saying, what is not observable is the application process. How many, to my, how many others I apply, it is true that uh, when the firm is posting a wage, the firm is posting a wage and is committing to post that wage, right? He cannot renegotiate the terms of trade once he acquires information about the worker's characteristic, right? So that- But, but is uh, it relevant, the number of applications? Isn't the number of offers the only thing that's relevant at no, the end for the worker? Well, the portfolio of application is important to, uh, as you see, uh, to try to screen a worker, right? If I could observe, uh, all the portfolio of application. And if, if I could make the wage I offer conditional on, on your overall portfolio of application, then, uh, then we would be, in a sense, we would not undermine the screening ability, right? So that would be an instance of, would be a situation where again, we have effectively a sort of exclusivity also in application uh, or observability and uh, we would expect then the screen in a sense would prevail, right? So the fact that we get pooling and rising comes is due to this limited information to the fact that I cannot observe, uh, right? When I observe a worker applying, I don't know to how many others he has applied. Okay, maybe we can come back to this later, right? If, uh, 
because of course that's uh, that is a key question and uh, so just in terms of literature I should also mention that there was uh, we are following uh, on steps that have been uh, pursued on the case uh, this idea of multiple application has been analyzed uh, in some earlier work by Philip Kircher and uh, uh, and various others uh, and uh, but they focused on the case where types are observable and private values in that in that environment the only effect of multiple application is lowering the search friction and uh, as we'll uh, see later the result is just simply convergence to the Varesian outcome and um, clearly a natural memory in the case of a single application and there is also some interesting work a related work with the possibility of uh, uh, by uh, Pablo Corlett and uh, Ben Lester and others uh, that is also kind of connected. Anyway, without... Uh, yeah, yeah, can I ask you a question related to the literature before you go yes, further? of course. In terms of the interpretation of the upper bound N on applications, um, an alternative way to model in principle would be that there's a cost to sending an application. Absolutely, absolutely. And naturally, this cost would be uh, more likely to be paid maybe by some types versus it would be a slightly different and the question is I guess why did you go one way or the other is it simpler or is it more we went uh, no, you're absolutely right and in fact I will mention at the end uh, so we do it for simplicity we carry out the analysis for the case where we have an exogenous fixed number of application and treat that as a parameter but we are discussing, uh, the, it's natural, the case you mentioned is absolutely natural to say, if you allow for the cost, for a fixed cost, indeed it is true that uh, uh, the different types would have a different incentive to send multiple application. Uh, in particular, the low productivity type would have more incentive to send more application than the others. The qualitative result does not change in any, in any respect. In fact, even the characterization equilibrium is not. So you don't get like Lauerman Volinsky type of thing where somehow, um, because they get the precisely that the diverse selection gets worse as n goes up because the differential incentive, I guess, of different types to, in their case, attract either search or attract people to an auction, different types somehow exacerbate the diverse selection as the cost of search declines. The, the characterization that we get is essentially the same when we allow for okay. cost, right? And right. I, I'm going to come back to that at the end, right? Absolutely, that's, a well, uh, that's an important point. All right, so the environment, as I said, is very simple and standard is the Akerlof environment and the story and the interpretation that we tell is in terms of the of the labor market so there is a measure one of worker there is a positive measure of firm and firms have to uh, have to choose whether or not to become active whether or not to post a vacancy and there is a cost k to post a vacancy and uh, every worker can supply one unit of labor and every firm is going to demand one unit of labor so there is capacity constraint also on the employer side. The worker can be of high or low productivity and uh, uh, we allow a special case where the productivity uh, uh, and they have a different outside option that is higher for the high productive worker than for the low productive. In general, we look at a case where, where we have the productivity is strictly higher for the more productive, but as a limit case, we can look at a case where productivity is the same. We assume there are positive gains on trade for every type and sigma is the fraction of low types in the population. So this is really the plain uh, ACL of environment. Now, let me explain how the trading process occurred. We assume that every firm, first every, the firm choose whether or not to pay the cost and become active. Then every firm who uh, chose to become active is going to post a wage. Uh, and uh, all, each worker is going to observe all the posted wages, all the wages posted by every firm and choose to send an application. So he's going to choose n firms to which to apply, right? So the, the n firms could be all firms that posted the same wage or could be firms posting different wage. And uh, the search friction means that there is no uh, centralized process to match uh, firms and workers. So the workers send an application uh, uh, using symmetric and anonymous strategies. In this environment, I don't think I need to uh, explain and motivate this much. Uh, so as a result, the applications of every worker can be summarized in terms of uh, the list of wages to which the firm apply. As I said, potentially, they can be all the same, right? But just convenience, I'm ordering the application in 
an increase in order in terms of the higher label is the higher wage to which I apply. And, and sorry, uh, yeah. The, the, the firm is restricted to just offering one wage. They cannot offer the a firm million. is offering one wage. No, exactly. And uh, we can discuss uh, whether that will make a difference. Uh, in the case of uh, one application, we know that it doesn't make a difference for the equilibrium outcome. Here, uh, I suspect it's not, but I suspect the same result would extend, but I, uh, we haven't really worked that out. Okay, so the important aspect is the matching procedure. Then uh, after the application of the, uh, of the work has occurred, every firm is going to uh, make an offer to one randomly picked worker, right? So here is important, what I said earlier, uh, the firm receives application from a number of workers that could be zero, but could be 10, could be 20. The firm does not observe the portfolio worker. So all the workers who apply to the firm looks indistinguishable to the firm is just making an offer to one picked at random. If the firm could observe the portfolio of application, of course, could infer something about the type of the worker supplying and could target their application uh, to one worker instead of other. But in the case we consider it does not. So it picked just one worker at random. Then uh, uh, as a result of this process, every worker is going to receive from zero to uh, N offers potentially. And is looking at all the offers, is, is rejecting the offers that are uh, below the highest, and is keeping the best one under consideration, right? So this is in the spirit of deferred acceptance. Because then every firm whose offer is rejected is going to make a new offer, and the process continues until there are no more rejections. As a result of that, we are forming a stable matching uh, between uh, firms and workers. So there are. Uh, so, so, there so Pietro. Um... Yeah? So it seems that what you have in mind here is some centralized matching system, right? Like deferred acceptance rather than a decentralized labor market. And if you have a decentralized labor market in, in mind, is, is it somehow sort of optimal to use those deferred acceptance type of strategies? Well, the process, I, descri the the process I described uh, is... Uh, does not require a centralized process, right? So that uh, uh, is true. You can implement that through a sort of centralized, but you don't need to because you can consider the sequential process as the one I described. Uh, the process I consider is uh, indeed, is biased in favor of efficiency, uh, right? It's an efficient force, uh, form of clearing of the market. Um, but, but it's an assumption that that the actors behave like this, right? Or, yeah, or yeah, yeah. No, these are the characteristics. Yeah. Not that's yeah. characteristics of the matching procedure. Yeah. Right? So that's an assumption. And uh, and in fact, in 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 this dimension, we are uh, following the lines of uh, one of the papers of Philip Kircher I mentioned. He also looked at the case uh, in another paper where they were allowing for some in inefficiency in the matching procedure. Uh, and then was analyzing the implication. We focus on that because we are mainly targeting to see, right, to what, how far we can go to the, uh, uh, and if we didn't want additional inefficiency just coming from the, from the matching process. Now, as a result of that, uh, can I uh, just jump in with a, yeah, a question or a comment? It seems, I think it's biased in favor of efficiency in the observable case, but with, with unobservable types um, having having the as, as the number of applications increases the number of offers that are being made also increases and the firm the firm might not might want to instead screen ex post by say committing to, to process only a certain number of applications you mean the firms may put a cap on the number of applications they receive uh, I, I, it's just a conjecture, but the fact, so as you increase the number of applications, the firms are processing more and more applications, making more offers until the, until yeah. the stable yeah. matches are formed. Uh, but, but that might sort of push out the high types, right? As if, if they, uh, I think you mentioned earlier that, um, they can't use market liquidity to screen, but if they could choose something 
a limited number of offers to, if they're only going to make say 10 offers and then and then after that you know give up that might allow some some screening um, ex post uh, with with that type of offer strategy what some some of that in a sense may come up in analysis I described because we are doing we are treating the number of offers that uh, work can make as a parameter we see how the equilibrium varies with that so we cannot we can give some answers to some of the questions you raised uh, of course, you could allow potentially a richer set of strategy by firms that they are imposing uh, a limit, a capacity constraint on uh, how many applications they screen. That would be an extra dimension in the strategy they have, and that might potentially be justified, right? So that would be an interesting issue to explore. Thanks. Uh, okay, so once the matching between workers are formed, then uh, trade occurs. Uh, workers are hired and then they trade and uh, the payoff of the worker uh, or the firm is the productivity of the worker minus the price or the expected productivity, the payoff of the worker is the wage minus the cost and zero without trade. And um, now in this environment as uh, standard in, uh, in this directed search model, uh, the key consideration to determine the probability of trade is the congestion in the different markets. And the first element of the congestion is the ratio between the number of application and the number of firms posting every wage. Now, in the environment, you consider we need to add a qualification, which is the fact that uh, uh, the application may not convert into acceptances because a worker is applying uh, to several uh, wages. So in particular, if I have a firm that is posting a low wage, uh, I have to take into account that uh, if the worker are going to get uh, an offer at a higher wage is posted in the market, there is a high chance they reject. And therefore I should uh, basically qualify then the application, the number of application I receive in terms of what is the probability they are accepted. So that is the notion of effective application. I have effective application, effective quality in the market for uh, any given price. And given that, uh, we can define, uh, right? So the we can take uh, a standard sort of Poisson specification of the probability of trade given the Q length as you do in the paper, but this just doesn't have to be like that. So these are the basic property that are just going to express what is the probability of the worker to receive an offer as a function of the effective Q length and what is the probability of the firm uh, of uh, uh, receiving at least one effective application therefore of being able to hire again, as a function of the Q length in the market. And uh, given that we can construct, uh, uh, we can write what is the expected payoff for the firm of posting a particular wage uh, that is a function of the probability of trade and the expected quality uh, that a firm expect to uh, have at that wage. And for the worker, uh, so for the firm is fairly standard, for the, for the worker, this uh, is, uh, uh, we have to face the, pro so the worker has to choose not one, but an application. So the process can be uh, studied recursively, studied from the first application, and uh, then progressively going to uh, higher and higher potentially wages for the subsequent, subsequent application. Uh, it should be pointed out, so this is just the expression that just characterizes the dynamics of the uh, utility of the uh, workers can get from more and more application. What is important uh, for the analysis which follows is to point out that as I increase the number of applications, the outside option for any application is the utility I would get. Uh, if you consider the nth application, my outside option is the utility I can get with the n minus one application. So that my outside option increase as I send more and more application. This is going to play an important role in the equilibrium characterization. And uh, now, in equilibrium, can I ask yeah, you? yeah, okay, sorry, that this is just for, for me to understand this um, application process a little bit better. So, I guess in, in adverse selection models in general, it's possible that uh, firms lose money on some types, especially if you have cross subsidization. I couldn't tell if you if that's a possibility here or not. Yes, now, uh, if that's the case, then potentially after some of the offers get rejected, I might want to stop making going uh, the next offer potentially. And I, in other words, then 
what matters from my perspective is I'm going to look at the mix of types that are going to show up at my door. And then, uh, especially if a discrete number of types are going to show up at my door, then I'm going to be learning while I go through this process of, you know, uh, you know, seeing if somebody is accepting an offer or not, but that seems to be absent. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing I'm, there's something that I'm missing, but so that, I, that would be helpful for me. Okay. So this expression here, this is the expected profit uh, of a firm uh, that as you see, takes into account the probability that I'm going to get uh, a low uh, versus a high productivity worker. So indeed, expose the firm, uh, if the firm is operating in a market where there is some pooling, whether a worker of different type applying, uh, then, uh, uh, then, uh, then indeed the firm may lose on one and gain on the others. And what count is the expected value. Now, so, yeah, the okay, other so point let me, that you let me, made... let me stop you there. Let me stop you there. Yeah, this is about the other point that I made. So this is independent of where it is in the stage of uh, making offers within a period, I guess. Right? These payoffs are independent of where I am within a period. In, yeah, in, uh, because, in other words, how many people have rejected my offers? Exactly. No, because we uh, the process was described was just to illustrate, in a sense, what is going to happen. Uh, but it's not the, we're not considering the possibility that firm may re-optimize, right? So the issue that you raise, I think, is an interesting issue. If we consider that really as a dynamic process, then firms along the time, in a sense, may uh, revise their inference on what is the uh, what is the probability of the worker they face, and uh, they may update that. That's uh, I think that's a, they that's ignore that information. Point. They ignore the information that's contained in turning down an offer effectively and they post the ex-ante these contract these wages these prices oh, they are they committing to the wages. Yeah, the potential information the, the potential information that's contained in the rejection they're ignoring wait that. wait piero now i'm confused are they are they is there information are they learning as they get offers yeah, rejected no, I, I thought no i thought all these guys were sorry go ahead no, no, they, uh, they don't know the portfolio and they are learning, but the probability that an offer is rejected. So no, when are, I, are they learning, are they learning about the pool of workers who have applied to them? Or, I mean, they might learn about a, or something about a particular individual after they reject the offer, but are they learning about the pool as? They, yeah, Okay, so let me explain. So here, when I wrote the effective application, right? So there is, at any wage, uh, there is a certain, uh, let's say, a certain expected number of high and low types potentially applying at a given work. Now, for each high and low productivity worker, there is a probability that they accept or reject. And this probability of accepting or reject my wage offer is different for the two types. Uh, right? So... That means that uh, I uh, I make a wage. Uh, so when I compute uh, in this expression here, when I compute the profits in this expression, I'm just considering overall, uh, right? If I stick to that process, if I keep, I make an, I pick a work at the random, I make an offer, is that rejected? I pick another at random and go on. I uh, I'm just. Uh, uh, this is the this is just reflects the ratio between uh, the number of uh, workers, low productivity workers, and high productivity workers times their probability of accepting. Right? If we were really to model the process at dynamic, which is not really exactly what I uh, what I said, that was more a story. But if you are model explicitly at dynamic, then uh, there is the potential possibility that along the process, if I if I make uh, 10 offers and they are all rejected. When I make the 11th offer, maybe the quality of the pool of uh, the quality of the pool may potentially change, right? So we are not allowing a sense for that possibility. I think that was the point that Ali was, was yeah, making, but, right? Peter, so, but then I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see Ali's point and, and I think it's a concern potentially if you think about this process evolving in that way. But 
then I, I don't really understand the algorithm and how how to think about it, especially if it's not centralized, right? If you think about each each person is doing its own thing, as you suggested before. Yeah. Right. I mean, I I made offers to half of the people in this in this seminar. Yeah. I got rejected from all of them. Then I say, oh, probably those. You know, I might say, and maybe it's not true, but I mean, you 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 should show us that, you know, those the half that are left are from our perspective the same, because otherwise I would want to stop making. No, offers. but they are the same. Right. Like no, it's not obvious to just... me. No, because if my decision to accept or reject depends on my type, it's not going to be necessarily true. To take them in a random order, you learn. You take them in a random just order. Just learn that the one that rejected they might, you. They decision to, you can pick randomly who you go for first, but if all the good types reject and all the bad types accept, the pool is getting better. And if it's the opposite, no. the pool is getting worse. So No, the pool is not. I mean, this is a feature of the pool, right? This is a feature of a Poisson distribution. Yeah, it's memory. The pool doesn't change. Well, then you're telling me that the acceptance rule is the same for everybody. I, anyway, yeah, I'm you, you learn not nothing. Cool. I'm just saying it's not obvious, and you might want to show it if it's true. That yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. I agree. So that's something that. Yeah. As I said. This was more like a motivating story along the decentralized line. And, uh, but effectively, we are basically saying that uh, this is the expected composition on the pool. And we are assessing that when we make the first offer or when we make the 10th offer of the first nine are rejected. But I agree, that's something that we indeed we need to clarify. Uh, now, um, in equilibrium, what's the uh, equilibrium properties? We have that the uh, Q length and composition, they have to be uh, consistent uh, for all the work with the strategy of the firms and the workers, so the probabilities of trade. And off equilibrium, uh, we use the condition that, uh, uh, as again, that's a fairly common condition in, the, um, in this literature, but this is basically, we expect that the Q length for the non-posted non wages is uh, set at a level that is going to uh, make one type of worker indifferent whether or not to apply in the spirit of some sort of sub game perfection. And that is also pinning down the type of the worker that is going to apply. Anyway, uh, so these are the, this is the definition of the equilibrium and we can now move to uh, analyze the, uh, to study the equilibrium. And uh, oh, I'm going to- I hate, I hate to slow you down, sorry. <clears throat> Can you just yeah. go a little more slowly through the off path stuff that tends to be really important in this model? Of course. Yeah, so the off path part is to say that for every wage that is not posted in equilibrium, the probability of, um, I'm setting the probability of trade uh, for, uh, uh, for a worker that were to apply. So if a firm were to deviate to, PHP, to price P prime, uh, I expect the Q length is such that the probability of trade for some worker is such that the worker is indifferent between sending uh, one application to that wage and uh, his equilibrium strategy. He's indifferent whether to deviate or not from the work. Okay, so it's uh, Gary Arishimer, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's why I said was standard. So one detail that's important here is if you you apply to a deviant firm, can you is is there at most one deviant firm or can it be multiple deviant firms? Like if a measure zero firms would deviate, for example, or if you would have a market maker, or is it necessary that there's only one so that you automatically send the rest to non-deviant firms? This is in the spirit of saying that if a single firm were to deviate, right, it's going to say how many, uh, right, what is the number of work that the firm would expect to attract, right? Mm -hmm. so now, this formally, this is again with a continuum uh, of traders, but you're saying if a single firm were to deviate, how many mm -hmm. workers the firm expect to attract, it would expect to attract uh, the uh, a number of workers such that uh, the effective queue length is such that those workers would be uh, 
indifferent between their current equilibrium strategy and the deviation. So therefore they would indeed be willing to deviate. That's a, that's a sense in which we talk about subgame imperfection. And that is going to determine what is the probability of trade also for the firm. And it's also going to pin down the beliefs about the quality of the workers who, are, uh, who the firm can attract with that. So, but we are thinking of a single firm deviating, right? There are no coalitional deviations here. No, okay, so, so, but, but, so here there is a difference between a single or a mesh zero that wouldn't work. So it's really a, literally a single, but that's, that's fine. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's yeah. just a Nash that's done that. So thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, okay, so as I said, so I'm cutting out, uh, I have to, just to present some results and I'm going to do all graphically. And the key ingredients for the graphical analysis is going to be the isoprofit curve uh, that here is stated for the case when I know the type, uh, that is the combination of uh, uh, Q length and prices that guarantee zero profit for the firms and the indifference curves, which is the combination again of prices and Q length that uh, are going to guarantee that a worker attain a certain level of utility. Uh, so the zero profit condition for, um, uh, for the uh, firm is uh, uh, like as we uh, as shown by uh, Kircher in his analysis. This is in the space of uh, effective Q length uh, and wages. This is a zero profit condition for the, for the firm. And uh, what happened? Okay, and uh, this is going to be the equilibrium with a single application. So this is the equilibrium which obtained at the tangency between a indifference curve for the first application of the worker and the zero profit line. And, uh, and as you see, so that characterized the wage and the probability of trade, uh, which is less than one due to the surge friction. If you then have a second application, then the second application is sent to a higher wage, which is going to uh, be such that uh, uh, the worker are going to trade with a lower probability at that wage, but uh, altogether they are increasing the probability of trade. Uh, and uh, as you see, so the beliefs in terms of the previous condition, the beliefs here in terms of the probability of trade is going to be determined by the upper envelope uh, of the indifference curves of the worker, right? So here we see that uh, for any price, I believe what is the Q length that is going to attract here, the first application here, the second application and so on. This is going to pin down the beliefs in terms of Q length, right? And similarly, we can determine. Uh, and uh, so when we increase the number of application, we let it potentially go to infinity. We let the surge friction go to zero. Uh, I, uh, as you see, so the number of applications are going to get, are going to go to higher and higher uh, wages. And in the limit, they are going to converge uh, to the Varesian price, which is the productivity minus the, uh, minus the cost of entry. And in the limit, the probability of trade, the probability that the worker is hired indeed uh, is such that uh, with probability one, the worker is going to be higher at the wage equal to its productivity minus the cost of entry. So indeed we have convergence to the Varesian outcome, which is indeed kind of supporting the idea that with this construction, indeed, we are uh, removing the search friction. With this construction, and of course, here the assumption we made on the matching protocol is going to be important. Now, um, what happens uh, when uh, uh, now we introduce uh, heterogeneous types, right? As long uh, if uh, the workers have the same productivity, they only have different uh, uh, this utility of work. Uh, then uh, we have, of course, uh, different indifference curves for the two types, the same zero profit condition, but the incentive constraints are going to be slack. So the same equilibrium allocation is going to remain. Uh, now let's move then to adverse selection, right? What is going to happen? Sorry, just, uh, just Yeah. Just, I'm, I'm less familiar with some of these things. So, so basically the, the, the move in the graph you had is basically because when you have only one offer, the market is very inefficient because we're gonna have congestion. And when yeah. we have many offers, there's no congestion because we'll figure out, you know, if Sarah and I both apply to your firm, you know, and, and to Vladimir's firm, you know, one will get matched to each essentially. Whereas if we can only make one offer, we'll both perhaps apply to you and half of us will be unemployed, that's the idea. 
So it's not about firms market power. It's just basically no, no, no. There is no market power. No, there is no market power here. The model effectively uh, is a model of. Uh, the firms are making zero profit in equilibrium. That is a continuum. So the firm always makes the inefficiency. The difference in those prices is because you're reducing the, the difference. In they are removing the, the search friction comes in the fact that with the single application, the workers are unevenly distributed. There, is, there are firms who receive three applications and firms who receive none. Yeah. That's inefficiency, right? So the fact that you cannot coordinate, you cannot sort efficiently workers to firms in the best way. That is what is generating the market friction. Now, if you allow uh, workers to apply essentially to all uh, to a large number of firms, you are eliminating that uh, element of friction. And uh, now, uh, when introduce adverse selection, we have the we have the fact that there is uh, incentive constraints are also going to matter, and they're also going to constrain the possible trades. And when we allow for multiple application, they in fact they get tighter. They get tighter because now it is, uh, um, well, I will explain that maybe uh, clearly in a second. Uh, so the first observation, first of all, is to say is that this diagram is saying, uh, this is, uh, in this diagram, I have basically the equilibrium with three applications when you have two high and low productivity workers when they are observable. Right? If they are observable, that's going to be the equilibrium with three application for the high and the low. And you see that, of course, the high productivity are going to get a higher wage. Now, if the productivity becomes private information, you see that this equilibrium cannot be sustained uh, because the incentive compatibility is violated because the low productivity workers would always want to apply to the higher wage to which the high productivity apply. So that's why they need in order to for incentive compatibility to be satisfied they basically need to accept they need to move up the uh, zero profit condition so as to accept a lower probability of trade so as to make sure that the low type don't want to uh, imitate them. right so that's uh, that is the basic idea that's a basic effect that uh, adverse selection here is going to generate and uh, the fact that you have multiple application is, on the other hand, is going to limit the possibility of uh, screening workers on the basis of the different probabilities of trade, right? And that's uh, what I'm going to illustrate now. Uh, so the result of uh, Guerrieri and others was that uh, uh, with a single application, we have uh, perfect market cementation. So this is going to be the equilibrium with a single application. So with a single application, the high productivity workers, they have to increase they are no longer tangent, they have to increase uh, the wage to which they apply to the point that is so where incentive compatibility is going to be satisfied. So they have to accept a lower probability of trade and that's the screening that occurred in the market. How do things change when you allow for more than one application? As you see, when you allow for a second application, if the worker, if the low type worker can send a second application, now uh, the equilibrium with uh, the wage to which the high type uh, choose in the one application case, now violate incentive compatibility. So this is the sense in which incentive compatibility becomes uh, more uh, tight. Uh, because now for the, for the low type are uh, more willing to apply to the high wage because they're already guaranteed that they get, if they cannot trade, they, get a, they can always trade at the lower wage with a much higher probability. So therefore, in order to satisfy incentive compatibility, I need to move up the wage in equilibrium to which the high type are applying like here, right? So the, the high type therefore are going to apply to a potentially higher wage, but they are trading with a lower probability. As you see, the Q length is going up. And therefore, as you see, so the second application then, uh, like in this example, may be at the same wage, right? So this illustrate a possible equilibrium with two application that we have in this case. So the low type are unconstrained, they trade uh, at these two weights, which are the same as the complete information. The high type are constrained. They send all their application to the same wage. And uh, now what happens when we increase the number of applications? When, uh, right, when we increase the number of applications, you see the incentive constraints get tighter and tighter. Now, another important observation that we have here is uh, for this to be an equilibrium, I need to make sure that the, uh, uh, incentive constraint of the high types is also not violated, which means that they don't want to apply to any of the wage to which the low types apply. 
And as you see, as you increase the number of applications, the low and low types, they get, they apply to higher and higher wages and the high types are pushed further up. So in the following result, therefore is showing, uh, is showing that under this condition, which is the standard lemons condition uh, in the literature, which is the condition such that the disutility uh, for the opportunity cost uh, for not working for the high productivity types is such that they are not going to accept any wage to which the low type apply. In that, under that condition, clearly the incentive constraint of the high type is never binding and uh, a separating equilibrium always exists. And, uh, uh, and indeed, uh, the equilibrium is going to be uh, characterized uh, like in this case with the low types uh, sending uh, their unconstrained set of application on the observable case and the high types send in application at higher wages and lower probabilities of trade. And uh, uh, on the other hand, when the lemons condition is violated, uh, right, which is illustrated like in this case here, then the high type, uh, the high productivity worker incentive constraint may be violated and the separating equilibrium that we constructed is no longer an equilibrium, why? Because if that is the case, you see that's the, the red one is the indifference curves of the high type for the first application. And given this, uh, so this is the wage and the uh, Q length that is such that the low type don't want to apply to the high type uh, wage, but at this wage, the high type want to apply to some of the low productivity worker. So that's why the separating equilibrium that candidate equilibrium that I described is no uh, breaks down when the lemon condition is violated. You know, just a clarification in the previous yeah. uh, case, there could be an equilibrium where the high types don't trade at all, correct? Uh, not yet. I mean, in this case, uh, I'm getting there, but uh, in here, they would always trade, right? That because there is always going to be some intersection for any finite and for any finite number of applications. I'm saying the limit. Sorry, I was saying the limit when goes In the pace. limit, that's exactly what we are getting. Yes. So that's uh, this is exactly uh, this okay. result, right? You jumped ahead, and I, as I let the number of application of the lot uh, uh, that worker can send go to infinity, then the then the low types send application to higher and higher price. Their indifference curves get steeper and steeper in terms of the previous picture which means that their intersection in terms of this diagram here is going to move further up here. And in the limit essentially is going to go to infinity. So therefore the high types are trading with probability zero in that case, right? And uh, so in the limit, as the number of application go to infinity under the, uh, this Lemons condition, the low type, the firm are trading with probability one, the low type trade with probability one, that's like in a Varesian equilibrium but the high type trade with probability zero. So the outcome is indeed is the Varesian, is the acker of equilibrium that we have in this, uh, for this kind of economy uh, under the Lemons condition. So we get convergence to the acker of equilibrium in this case. Right, so that's, uh, uh, so that's a sense in which the high types are driven out of the market. But as we said, the separating equilibrium does not, uh, does not exist when the Lemon condition is violated. And uh, we can show, and that in a sense is probably more interesting, even more interesting is other you know, than I, I found. A, I have a very, sorry, I have a, a stupid question to ask. Yeah, I can go back to the please. Yeah. So here, I'm, I'm confused about why in this condition, the uh, type distribution doesn't show up. Usually because the equilibrium I is separated. The equilibrium is separating. When, the, when you have a separating equilibrium, the mass of high versus low type does not matter. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Warrasian market uh, of the Akerlof allocation. Well, because we Akerlof have, allocation is types, always yes. a function of type distribution, correct? It depends. It the bull, depends the bull on whether I have. Uh, okay. Uh, under this condition, this is you the bad equilibrium. You always have an you always have an equilibrium where the high types don't trade. Okay, I see. You're Makarov, assuming that literally if you have a sufficiently not, yeah, uh, if you have a sufficiently uh, high mass of high types, then maybe another equilibrium that is pulling, and uh, right. 
Absolutely. Uh, I guess the, the, the only thing that the, the, the only qualification that I would add is the disequilibrium when you Converges have Converges uh, to the one, the, the, the angle of equilibrium may have one or two according to the, exactly according to the, to the I got it. I got proportion I got it. is Thank converging you. to one of those. Yes. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, now when we have uh, the next result is to show that we can have pooling in equilibrium. And uh, now again, this is uh, this is quite novel because typically in the direct research, we don't have pooling, we tend to have separation throughout. And that was also true uh, with adverse selection as long as we have a single application. The argument here, which is like the one in the guerrieri shimer framework is very simple. If we consider any pooling market, the indifference curves of the low and the high type are going to cross like that. And there is always a profitable cream scheme in deviation. Raising the price, I remember, remind, Remember that the beliefs are always the upper envelope of the indifference curves. If I raise the price, I always believe that I attract a high, type, high productivity worker and therefore there is a profitable deviation. Now with multiple applications, that is not true. We can have a situation like this. We can have a situation where, uh, so this describes an equilibrium with two applications where the, the low types and the first application was separating to a low price that is separating and they send their second application to the same price to which the high types send their first application. And the characteristics of this is such that, as you see, at this equilibrium, the upper envelope of the indifference curves always feature the low types. Why that is the case? Because the indifference curves of the high type or their first application indeed is uh, steeper than the one of the low type or their first application. But for the second application, we get a reversal. The indifference curves uh, for uh, the low type for their second application is steeper than the one for the high types. And why is that? Because the outside option is going to increase. When the low types send already a first application to this wage, their outside option may end up being higher than the opportunity cost for the high type not to be higher at all. And therefore it is now Again, the low type that is more keen to trade even at higher wages, right? So this reversal of the single of the way in which the indifference curves are going to cross implies that indeed we can have a pool in equilibrium. And that's an equilibrium because at any price that no deviation is profitable because any deviation is only going to attract the low types. So in this equilibrium, as you see, you have that uh, the high types and the first application to a pooling market and the second application to this, right? So that's the basic idea of the pooling equilibrium. And that is how this reversal of the indifference curves is playing a crucial role to ensure that this equilibrium in a sense can obtain, right? So therefore uh, we can show that, uh, that was an illustration. We can show that indeed under the, when the Lemons condition is violated, as long as the number of application is sufficiently large, there is always an equilibrium like the one I described whether it's going to be a pool in market. And uh, when we let the number of applications go to infinite, again, in equilibrium, you are going to have that uh, all the workers are going to trade, at almost all trades occur at the pooling price. So we are effectively converging to the pool in equilibrium, but it's not exactly the acre of pool in equilibrium. Why? I mean, the composition is, is the population because the, all the worker trade with probability one uh, convergent one at that uh, at that wage. It's not because we have excessive entry because the equilibrium is going to feature uh, an excessive entry characterized by the fact that uh, uh, the firms are going to trade with probability less than one. And uh, why that is the case, the reason uh, is that, uh, uh, as we said, in order to guarantee that uh, uh, we have a, a we have a vision. The firms are going to trade with probability one. The Q length has to go to infinity. But uh, as we see from this construction, the Q length cannot quite go to infinity because uh, if we move uh, this further up, that means the low type worker are going to send more application to separate in price, and then the incentive constraints of the high type may end up being violated. So in other words we have to keep the wage and the probability and the Q length in the pooling market not to grow too much to ensure the incentive compatibility also the high productivity work. And the fact that this cannot grow to infinity is going to generate the results of the inefficient end. Now, we can also have other equilibria 
in this case, right? Once we have pool in equilibrium, uh, uniqueness uh, is going to disappear. We can have several equilibria with the pooling market. We can also have uh, equilibria with uh, uh, multiple pooling markets. And we can also construct equilibria with multiple pooling markets that are efficient, right? So that's, this is an illustration of an equilibrium where we have two pooling markets. There is a low pooling market where the first sort of application uh, after the first are sent by high and low productivity workers. And then there is a second pooling market with a higher price to which all the subsequent application are going to be sent. And uh, this uh, now is the one where we can let the queue length as we let the number of application increase, we can move this further up so that indeed we can have efficient trade, right? So in this case, we can have, so bottom line is that we can have uh, convergence to the um, uh, to the Ackerl of uh, pool in equilibrium uh, that is going to be efficient, but we still have, uh, 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 but we still have multiplicity of equilibrium. We can also have equilibria that are inefficient. So again, there are interesting analogies, but also difference with the non-exclusivity in contracting as shown by the result by Atari. In their case, uh, they were getting that uh, the outcome uh, was converging to the alpha of equilibrium. In fact, was converging to the efficient alpha of equilibrium. We show that that may not be the case. Now, an important reason to understand that the force that is going to lead to pooling is going to be similar to the one in non-exclusivity. Uh, as I mentioned, because it, we are uh, limiting this uh, screening role of market liquidity. Uh, what is important and allow for the multiplicity of equilibrium, the possibility also of Pareto rank, possible equilibrium in the limit, is the fact that we have the capacity constraint on the firm side. So the firms can only hire one worker. So this is going to make the model essentially competitive, right? So no firm has really market power. They are still strategic in the ways they can post, but they have very limited ability to upset the equilibrium. And that is the reason why we can have this uh, multiplicity and persistent uh, in the limit. And uh, just to uh, very briefly, uh, this is connected to a point that Ali mentioned. We can also show that indeed under, this is the case when we have the lemon condition, under the lemon condition, if the proportion of the high type is sufficiently high, then Akalov showed that there exists another equilibrium in addition to the separating one, which is a pool in equilibrium. And we showed that that indeed is true in our setup, right? In that case, we also have an equilibrium where low and high type trading in the limit, trading a single pool in market. And uh, so that coexists with the with separating equilibrium. And uh, so we're gonna have again this coexistence of equilibria. Uh, that is different from uh, the literature on exclusivity or also uh, the one with more strategic one when firms don't have a capacity constraint. So that I think is illustrating the importance of the capacity constraint uh, in the result that we, uh, that we attained. And uh, now uh, about welfare, uh, uh, right? and getting close to the end. So the result that we get in terms of welfare is that as we increase the number of applications, and this connects to some of the questions that came up at the beginning, uh, the, uh, without adverse selection, we always convert to Varesia. We just remove the search friction. Clearly the welfare increase monotonically uh, with the number of applications. With adverse selection, the effects are more ambiguous. It's clear that the low types always gain when we increase, uh, when we let the number of application increase, but the high type may lose when we increase the number of application. In particular, in the case where the equilibrium is separating, they lose because they're driven out of the market. And uh, the ex-ante welfare of the worker may also decrease as a result, right? So that means that the welfare implication are clearly uh, not uh, as smooth as in the case of the Varesian outcome. Finally, uh, and this was the point uh, that Vladimir mentioned at the beginning, uh, what happens if instead of fixing the number of application, if we let, uh, uh, if introduce a cost of application, if we introduce a cost, uh, uh, if workers face a cost of applying, they can choose the number of application. So what is going to happen is that in equilibrium, uh, of course, the L types are going to send the number of application of their sort of in the separating equilibrium, they send the number of application of their unconstrained solution where the benefits at the margin are equal to the cost. 
the high types are going to uh, send fewer application. And uh, when the cost is, uh, is very close to zero, they end up sending a possibly a zero number of application in the limit. So we have a situation where only the low types are going to apply and the high types, since at the end, the probability of trade is so low, they don't even bother and they don't send application. That's for the case of the separating equilibrium. For the case of pooling, uh, uh, even when the, you let the number of application go to infinity, uh, the low types, if the cost is negligible, they send the application like in the equilibrium we constructed. The high type are going to send the application that go to the pooling markets like the equilibrium we have, and, but they're going to send fewer applications. So this is just to suggest in what sense I claim that the equilibrium when we endogenize the cost of application indeed has the same features the one I described. And I think I'm over time, so. Uh, thanks, Piero, for the great presentation. So we have uh, 10 minutes for, for Q&A. So basically, if there is any further question from the panelists, you can continue to ask your question. And uh, if there is any question from regular attendees, please raise your hand using the raise hand function of Zoom, and we are going to allow you to, uh, to ask your question live. Piero, I'll ask you a quick question. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So this conclusion you have is, mm, well, perhaps the models are very different, but I remember in this lowerman wolinski they have a couple of papers of different settings, but where search is endogenous, where, again, this feature that different types have different incentives to, to search is important. And they somehow make the case that the, um, the deep differential incentive to search is very crucial. So if you shut that down in their models, results would be very different here you say it's not so important even if they searched in a symmetric way by force you get very right. similar outcomes they will not i mean the number of application is going to be different it's clear the load types are more application now uh from what i remember the uh lauren and Volinsky, they had uh some issues in terms of having to do with um the traders receive signal about aggregate condition. There is a condition, they, there are, they are focusing on uh, aggregation of information uh, that clearly is not, it's not an issue in this environment. There is not, there is no information in sense to aggregate. The traders don't, there are no private signal to aggregate. Uh, so that's a sense in which there are some underlying differences between the two. I don't know, there was some other question at the beginning. I don't know if I answered as we went along. I partly deferred them. So if there is anything pending there. This question that Willie just posed, that Willie, I'm, I'm speaking for you since you didn't say it, you just put it in the comments. I think it's an important one. <laughs> Maybe now you wanna jump in and say it. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I didn't see the chat, so I don't know if. No, I was just no, I just I just made a small comment that uh, that is it's it's not the traditional <clears throat> lemons. I mean, perhaps the lemons condition should be better defined, but that I mean, my understanding of it is always that at the pooling price, the high types would not want to trade. That's the first thing, uh, and then a second thing is you add the K parameter in there, so uh, so it's. So it's, it's an additional difference. So I, I'm not sure I, uh, I will use that terminology, although I, I believe in spirit is close to what you want to do, measure some sense of the degree of adverse selection. But uh, I, I will clarify it slightly different than what people are used to think about on these conditions, that, that's all. On the, are you mean but on I the lemon condition that, definition? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, there is the issue of the name, but also this idea that, you know, the K is sunk after, you know, after we've met. And so the, the efficiency properties, that I, it's just, it, it's hard for, for me to wrap my head around it. Yeah, um, I mean, the K is important when you're deciding to end or not, but once we're in the match, yeah. exactly, it's not, yeah. the K should, is irrelevant. Right, but you're posting a wage, right? In some sense, you're committing to the wage. 
No, no, no. I know, but I mean, in equilibrium, I have to recoup the K, so there has to be a quasi rent of size K to recoup my investment. But I'm just saying it's a little bit. Again, I'm, maybe I'm just not familiar with how people do this in search, but I'm saying this is a little bit different than what we would do in a competitive setting where there is no friction and. But no that problem. would be yeah. But the K is just a, if you take the if you take the arcle of you add the cost of entry, you get exactly that. I think the K doesn't make any difference right? because that okay. would be a competitive. Once I'm inside, once I'm inside, the decision of whether I'm willing or not to offer the pooling wage is independent of K. Yeah, yeah, but I anticipate. So therefore, I'm not really. I perfectly anticipate in a Varesian world. If you were to do the Akalov with a cost of entry, you would get the equilibrium the one we characterize, right? Because of course, you anticipate what is going to be the current way, the wage that you expect to have in the market, and given your correct anticipation of the wage, I, I'm you not would... saying you're wrong, Peter. I'm I'm just saying in terms of terminology and how people refer to this and. You're using a definition from a different literature to some extent. No, 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 exactly. No, no. They, I don't know if it's uh, been used in the search environment or not. No, no, no. I'm the the Lemon's condition, I, uh, I agree. In fact, we once <laughs> we talked briefly about it. Uh, we are, that's what we interpret, right? If referring that to Lemon's condition, uh, because that would be the case where it's, uh, right? He's abstracting from the, Proportion, anyway, that's fine. Uh, so maybe I can just add. So I, I mean, so in terms of the name, um, if I, if we didn't mess up, we took it from Daily and Green, um, and uh, so basically what we want to say. So the reason the K is showing up. So um, basically the productivity of the low type minus K is the competitive wage that firms would pay for low types. And we, what we want to say is that the high types outside option is above that competitive price. So the high type would not want to trade at that price or at that wage. That, that's our condition. And that's why the K has to show up. No, no, suppose K is a million. So, so here I disagree a little bit. So I, again, I understand that in equilibrium, it plays kind of the same way. But once you're inside, I suppose this is a two-stage thing. You pay a cost to enter, and then you decide the wage. And, yeah, and but now, you wouldn't enter if it's a million. No, no, obviously I wouldn't end. I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Sarah. I'm not disagreeing on, on the correctness to some extent. I'm, I'm just saying in terms of the, the intuition, it's, it's slightly different when you're making the analysis before you decide to enter the market that once you're inside the market and what does it mean? It usually means that at this wage, you know, I would be losing, if I want to track both what's the minimum wage I need and at that wage I would be losing money. Here, you wouldn't be losing money in the trade. You would be losing money from an exam perspective, but those are slightly different things. That's all I'm trying to say. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a big point, but- uh, But I, that's I, going I to be the relevant one for us. We basically, yeah. We, do, we just want to do it in terms of the competitive price to the low type. So this is the highest wage that firms would post if they expect to attract the uh, low type. And so we want, just want to ask, would the, would the high type be willing to trade at that wage? No, no, no. This is, again, I'm, this is why I posted it. I like what Ali said. Uh, That's why I posted it in the chat. To no, some so, so I, I guess let me, let me say why I think this is. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I'm I saying it's, it's just more of a, you know, given the <laughs> readers. Let me cut in and say why, why I thought this is important. Sorry. OK, sure. The, the, the main reason is I, I'm, I was really interested to see um, whether the equilibrium here is actually constrained efficient, is there, is there a possibility to do? So in other words, the Akerlof equilibrium that you're picking is actually inefficient if you had many types. If, if you had many good types, that's an inefficient equilibrium and your, your equilibrium is converging to quote unquote that. If you had uh, many bad types, then, uh, uh, then, uh, then the then the equilibrium seem to be the allocation seem to be efficient that you're converging. To. So I wanted to sort of see if if there is a way to sort of think about this as um, uh, if we can think about just sort of the beyond this, can we do something to make equilibrium better? Better in what I mean, in some sense. I mean, the welfare analysis was partly hinting at that direction, right? So that depends. As you see, that depends on what are the characteristics, the feature of the adverse selection, no? because if, okay, so if, 
that forget the lemon condition if you call it what we call severe adverse yeah, selection. Squiggly, squiggly condition, yeah, it's fine. Right, exactly. <laughs> what we call severe adverse selection. <clears throat> then we have that uh, indeed the low types gain, but the high types are going to lose always because they're driven out of the market. Now, uh, that's, that's the way. on the other hand, if that condition is violated, as we said, uh, when that condition does not hold, uh, what we call the milder adverse selection, in that case, there is always an equilibrium that is in fact, is first best efficient because it's pooling. Everybody trade with probability one. So that is the pooling equilibrium of Kakerlof, and that is right. Now, that of course is with two types, right? Of course, if you add more types, then and that, that's more demanding, right? In terms of having an equilibrium where everybody trades. Thank you. So I had a question about welfare. So if increasing um, allowed number of applications may potentially decrease the welfare, first of all, um, are there have you derived conditions that specifically leads to um, either constant or lower welfare? And second of all, is there a scope for some policy, like say, like just banning more than N bar applications with the welfare enhancing? Well, yeah, the, the welfare is kind of, it's going to say that indeed, it may not be uh, obviously beneficial, right? So this increasing context may not, clearly be beneficial and then of course you can then think of what can be uh, uh, right you may want indeed to limit uh, the kind of contracts right so that would be uh, right so when I said if ex ante welfare indeed is going to decrease in equilibrium increasing the number of application then uh, you may want to consider those kind of regulation I sorry I missed the first uh, question you had uh, so have you derived uh, conditions under which um, welfare either does not change or decrease? Well, as you see, the condition under which welfare is going, uh, is going to decrease uh, is, um, uh, is clearly uh, the natural candidate for that is the case where you have the separating equilibrium because the welfare of the, or the high productivity worker is going to decrease. So if, uh, of course, if you have a population with a large mass of high productivity worker relative to low productivity workers, then it's easy to see that uh, the ex-ante welfare of the worker is going to decrease because the low type gain, but they are so few, then the losses of the high type being driven out of the market is more such as more than offset. Right? So that would clearly be uh, an instance of a situation. So a severe adverse selection plus a large mass of uh, a large fraction of uh, uh, high productivity workers, that would mean they are better off in the equilibrium uh, with a single application. Okay, so that's a condition on uh, that's a condition on the severity of the adverse selection and on the fraction and on the fraction, right? On the composition, on the composition, yeah. Okay. 